Hi, I'm Old Nurse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. In J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit, we encounter 13 dwarf names, plus Gandalf, or Old Norse Gandolver, which are derived from, directly or indirectly, the Norse poem Volusborn, which is the first poem in the medieval collection called the Poetic Edda, which is a a uh, loosely affiliated collection of poems about the Norse gods and heroes based on oral tradition from the Viking Age and written down in Iceland in the 1200s. Now, everything that I just said is pretty easy information to find. Um, you know, that the, the dwarf names are based on uh, Voluspa. But if you just go look up Voluspa, whether in Old Norse, uh, in something like Jonas Christensen and Bjørsted and Olesen's edition of uh, Etikvæði, or in a translation like my own, you're not going to see direct one-to-one -one correspondence to all of those dwarf names. So what I'm going to do in this video is look at the Old Norse tradition, uh, the, the manuscript tradition, underlying those dwarf names so that we can see exactly where Tolkien got his and then as kind of a bonus, like, what do these dwarf names mean, if we can even tell? Now, I wouldn't be surprised if someone who is a big Tolkien enthusiast has maybe gone through and uh, looked at exactly what I'm looking at. But I wanted to look at the manuscripts themselves for both the Poetic Edda and the distinct, but unfortunately like-named Prose Edda, uh, just out of my own curiosity. So, in the poem Voluspa, which is uh, an account of how a vulva or cirrus uh, sees the beginning of the world as well as its end at Ragnarok. There is this weird, long interpolation where she talks about the names of the dwarves. Um, and if you look at different manuscripts, so we've got two complete manuscripts of the poetic of the of Volusbon. One is in the main manuscript of the Poetic Edda, the Codex Regius, or Conan's book manuscript. GKS 2365. Another is in the manuscript of Hugsbok, and then we have most of the text of Voluspa independently attested because Snorri Stutlason quotes it extensively in his prose edda. And looking at all these different versions, looking at uh, the Konigsbok version of the uh, Voluspa, looking at the Hugsbok version of Voluspa, and then looking at different manuscripts of Snorri's prose edda, we get different versions of the names of all these dwarves. And there's a lot more than the ones that, that Tolkien mentions. So, you know, why is that? Why are these names there? Why is there so much variation in it? I think part of why there's so much variation is that it's not like these are important characters in any story. No one really knows, like, why these names are there already when they're writing them down in the 1200s. And so you get names, you know, people aren't hearing them right. Uh, or, or, or aren't reading them right because they're unfamiliar words and names. And so my translation of the Poetic Edda is based on the manuscript uh, Codex, Codex Regis, right? So the way that I spell the dwarf names there and the particular names that you're going to see there, because there are some that are like left out in one manuscript but included in another, and those vary from manuscript to manuscript, are all based on, on Codex book. But having looked at uh, four manuscripts while I was preparing this video. I looked at the Codex Regis of the Poetic Edda, looked at the Hoiksbog, Volospa, uh, the Codex Regis of the Prose Edda, GKS 2367, which, by the way, uh, there's a whole video where I looked at that manuscript in person with Hoiker Thorgerson at the uh, Institute in Iceland where it's kept. It's uh, worth looking at if you're interested in this sort of stuff. And then I looked at the uh, uh, Uppsala. Wait, was it Uppsala or was it Wormianus? So I looked at another very divergent uh, prose edda uh, manuscript. 
and in each one, the dwarf names are different. Where I found Tolkien's dwarf names was the Codex Regis of the prose edit. Now, I don't know if he had access to the manuscript itself. I don't know that he ever went to Iceland, but surely he must have read some edition either of the prose edda or of Voluspa itself where the, uh, the, the dwarf names were spelled and presented as they are in the Codex Regis of the prose edda. All right, so let's look at what those names are and uh, where we find them. So first of all, in The Hobbit, we've got Thorin Oakenshield. Now the name Thorin occurred in uh, I think all the manuscripts that I saw, hard to say what it means. It could be related to Thora, which means dare. Uh, so you have something like the daring one. I think that's a, a fairly solid interpretation. Um, others have connected it to Thorin, which would mean like shriveled or withered, uh, weathered. I think that's pretty tentative because typically they do uh, maintain long versus short consonants, that Thora versus Thora would be different words. So I think the dare interpretation is more likely. If you look at, for example, and by default, when I talk about Volospa, I'm gonna talk about uh, Codex Regius of the Poetic Edda uh, stanza division. Thorin is in stanza 12. Oakenshield, Akinskeldi is in stanza 15. So they're not the same dwarf in, uh, in the, the Volospa list. Akinskeldi, quite directly means open shield, right? Maybe one with an open shield. So that one's easy enough. Feely and Keely come together in stanza 13, again, using uh, Codex Regis of the Poetic Edda stanza divisions. Very, very hard to say what these mean. It's been proposed, <laughs> and I, I guess it, it's on the edge of plausibility, that these are from German not Norse or Icelandic German terms for tools. In the contemporary language Middle Low German, a file would be feel and a wedge would be keel. Now these are not the names of these tools in uh, Old Norse or Icelandic. For example, uh, Icelandic today, a file like the tool is uh, thjöl, so it's not the same word. Um, but then why are there German names in this Norse text that otherwise shows, you know, no particular affinity to Germany, aside from being uh, in a language that, you know, is a thousand years separated from German. I, I'm a little skeptical of it, except for the fact those two names come immediately together, and uh, at least in the Codex Regis of the Poetic Edda, are also followed not too far after that by the name Noli, which looks like a needle. So just maybe these names go back to, again, a German source where you have dwarves named for tools. A little bit skeptical, but that's the best explanation that I think one can offer for Feely and Keeley, because there's not obvious things for them to mean in Old Norse. Um, the Old Norse word for elephant is a little bit unusual. It's Feel, uh, but then why would you have like, you know, it's very hard to connect a dwarf to an elephant, right? Like, I, I, I just don't see an obvious connection there. All right, Owen. This is kind of interesting because this is one where you have to look it up in the Codex Regis of the Prose Edda. So again, where Snorri is quoting uh, the Poetic Edda. In the Codex Regis of the Poetic Edda, which I'm translating from in my Poetic Edda translation of Olaf's Bob, this name is Oi, long A-I, which is a great-grandfather, actually the companion of Edda, great-grandmother. But uh, that name in the Codex Regis of the Prose Edda alone, and its quotation from Voluspa is Owen, long O-I-N-N. -N. Um, if that is the original form of the name, and this could just be somebody mishearing Oi, because already these would both be uh, long, rounded vowels at the time, uh, Owen would mean uh, potentially something to do with fear, because we have a, a verb, oas, uh, to fear. Uh, you see it, for example, it's, it's not very common, but it's it's found in poetry, like in Grimness Mall 20, when Odin says that he fears ek omsk, uh, that, that his ravens won't come back. But potentially, again, this is someone mishearing oi 
uh, great-grandfather. Another one where we have potentially a mishearing is uh, Glowin. Uh, this is also only in the Codex Regius of the uh, Prosetta, although it's also in the Hoekspoke text, although clearly, again, Tolkien is getting his names from the Codex Regius of the Prosetta, or someone's edition of it. Uh, in the Codex Regius of the Poetic Edda, this name is Glowy, without the ends at the end. And most plausibly, this is just connected to Gloa, meaning glow. So that one, at least, is pretty easy. If you're watching this on YouTube in 2023, uh, you're going to see a quick message from my friends at Grimfrost, and then I'll be right back. And then I come to the name Balin, or Balin, I don't know how this is said in Tolkieniana. Uh, that is the one name I cannot find in any version of Bolospa in the Old Norse manuscripts. I'm not sure where he got that name, but it's the one that I can't account for. Then we have uh, Dwalin. This is just a little bit anglicized from the Old Norse name Dvalin, which of course we find in uh, Bolospa. Example stands 11, Codex Regis of the Poetic Era. I would connect that probably to the verb dvelia, meaning to, well, it's related to English dwell, but it's more like uh, stay behind, wait, be delayed. So potentially it's something like a slow one. Then there's Ori. Now, Ori and Dori are two names that, again, we only find in Codex Regis of the Prose Edda. So you won't find it in my translation of, you won't find the names Ori and Dori in my translation of Polspa and the Poetica. Hard to know what to do with Ori. Uh, it's been suggested it could be connected to, for example, the adjective Ur, uh, just the, the same root without I mutation. This would then mean something like madness. You see the same root in a uh, feminine plural or modern Icelandic masculine plural uh, noun, Orar, meaning like frenzies, like crazes. Dori, no idea what to do with this. Uh, if it were two R's, you'd get Dori, which is a word uh, you sometimes see for um, a castrated ram, right? The weather. Uh, but again, they're so good in these manuscripts about distinguishing between long R and short R that I, I doubt that's the connection. And it could just be another misheard word passed down an endless game of telephone for centuries that nobody remembers. The original meaning or significance of. Uh, then we got Nori. That's another one I really have no idea what to do with. Um, you know, there's a very archaic word that you basically don't even see in Icelandic, Nor, that's like inlet. So would it be the one from the inlet or the bay or the sea? I just kind of doubt it and I don't really know what to do with this one. Again, probably a name irrecoverable after centuries of oral telephone games. And then we have three that come in order in all the manuscripts, although they're spelled very differently in different manuscripts. Uh, Biffer, Buffer, Bomber. In the Codex Regis of the Poetic Edda, from which I translated Bolspa, uh, these are given with Bs, Bivar, Bavor, and then we get Bombor. Um, however, once again, I think he's getting his names from the Codex Regis of the Prose Edda, where these have Fs. Now, in Old Norse, the Fs would still be pronounced V, Biver, Bulver, but uh, that's clearly where he's getting it because that's because they're spelled in the Codex Regis of the Prose Edda like he spells them in the Hobbit. Uh, Bomber, impossible to know what to do with this, especially because it's spelled so many different ways in different manuscripts. Also, don't really have a good suggestion for Bavar. Biver could be related to uh, Biva. Uh, Bivas means to tremble. You see this in a very memorable stanza of the poem Atlakviva talking about the heart of the hero Hogni is going to be cut out but won't tremble on the plate that it's uh, placed on. Uh, that This could also then be connected to uh, Bivrost, the name of the rainbow bridge to Oskarthur, where the gods live. Um, that is uh, plausibly interpreted as the trembling or like shimmering mile Bivrost. Uh, it's not Bifrost. The second word isn't frost because it's uh, Okadara, not, not regular O. So some difficult names there. 
And then, of course, finally we get to who else but Gandalf in the Old Norse that is Gandolver. Gandr is a general word for magic or a magical item. Magical staff or wand is a, a, an application of it. And then Olver meaning elf. Now, originally, in this list of dwarf names, Gandalf is nothing more than just one of the dwarves. Uh, Tolkien apparently decides, you know, what should I do with this wizard elf name? And he comes up with the character of Gandalf somewhere along the way. Uh, the name Gandalf does actually occur elsewhere. Uh, for example, I believe it's in the early part of the saga of King Halfdan the Black, uh, father of King Harald Fairhair, the first king of unified Norway. He fights a king of uh, the area that's now roughly Oslo, uh, uh, Old Norse, the, the Vingelmork, which potentially means horse penis forest, uh, and that king's name is Gondolven. So the name was apparently also used of uh, just regular human beings, or weird human beings. Um, you know, I think that probably, uh, and, and a lot of people have come to convergent thoughts about this, one of the best writers on the subject is Arman Jakobsen, who has suggested that elf is a pretty general category in Old Norse for a lesser supernatural being, right? Not a god, but some kind of lesser supernatural being who is nevertheless benevolent in orientation toward human beings. Its opposite would then be troll. So that elf isn't a species, but rather kind of an umbrella term that can include things like dwarves. And uh, in that case, it makes sense that you would have some names for dwarves that include the word elf. There's also Gandalf is next to Wind Elf, Wind Alver, in the, the list of dwarf names. So, uh, you know, I don't think that there's any great mystery why there's an elf, quote unquote, name in the dwarf names, because elf is apparently a category that includes dwarf. Now, if you look at the list of dwarf names in any version of Olspa, you're going to see a lot more than that. Um, for example, in Volspa and the Codex is the Poetic Era. Uh, we get uh, Nui and Nidhi. Nui meaning like the new one, uh, but then Nid is actually the term for the new moon in Old Norse. Versus Nui is the term for the full moon. A little bit confusingly, they call the new moon. The, they call the full moon the new moon. Uh, then you have like North, South, East, West, Northri, Sutri, Estri, Vestri. You get uh, some names that are actually just kind of normal human names that you see around, uh, like Throin is a, a human name, or uh, Regin is arguably the name of a dwarf in, uh, in Saga of the Volsungs. It's a little unclear if we should understand him as a dwarf or a human in the saga, uh, but you also see it for normal human dudes. Uh, you see names that look kind of God-ish, right? Uh, for example, in Sansa 15, in the Codex Regis of the Poetic Era, you see Kor, which looks like the word for uh, one-eyed, which is taken on by Odin. With two R's, it would mean the gray, the gray-haired one. Or it can also mean the, the high one. So it looks like one of Odin's names. So is Odin a dwarf, or does a dwarf share a name with him? We see a name, Fjallar, which is also used for the rooster, who will crow when Ragnarok comes uh, in, in Jotunheimar. There's also a rooster in Valhol and a rooster in Hell that will crow. There's Frosty, or Frost Tree, actually, in um, Codex Regis, the Poetic Edda, but I think the other manuscripts have Frosty, which is probably right. Um, I use that, of course, in translating Frosty the Snowman into uh, Old Norse. There's a, there's a dwarf who's just named Elf, Olver, there's a really interesting name, Mjold Vitnir, which is either Mead Witness or Mead Monster, that could be connected in some way that we don't understand to a variant of the story of the theft of the Mead by Sutunger, but he steals it from dwarves in the version of the story that we know. So, you know, whatever is going on with some of these names that we just you know, have no clue about the origins of, you know, your Hanar, your Spior, uh, your On and Anar, your, your Bomber, your Nori, your Loni, your Hepti, your Vili. 
there could or scare beer, your beer, beer there could be long lost stories lying behind them but i assume probably most of those stories were basically long lost already when the poetic edda and the prose edda were being written down in the 1200s otherwise you wouldn't have all this confusion about how they're even spelled between uh, at least four manuscripts and i assume that in the other manuscripts of the prose edda you see similar confusion too so it's a reminder that you know not everything is there uh that we would like to be there that you know if you ask me what's going on with Spearbeer and beerbeer who are what can you tell me about these wars well i have nothing to tell you about them except you know uh huh, weird names that we can't don't have explanations for them. and uh you know i think that it's a curious reminder that even in saying something as seemingly plain as well tolkien got the names of the dwarves from bolispa that the story is actually not that straightforward because he didn't get them exactly from Volospa, he got them from the prose edda quoting Volospa, and even then, one version of the prose edda quoting Volospa, or again, somebody's edition of it, because I don't think he went to Iceland and looked at the manuscript. Um, and that's just a reminder of just how complicated the relationships between these texts are, even when you bring in seemingly simple 20th and 21st century uh, pop culture references to them. Well, that's enough of shouting in this cave uh, without a microphone. Uh, I am working on the microphone question. I ordered another one, the one that Ian McCollum uses. Hopefully that'll work better. Uh, folks, I want to thank my Patreon supporters. They're the ones who make these videos possible. Uh, absolutely, fully, literally could not do this without you all. And, uh, well, from beautiful Wyoming, I want to wish all of you all the best.